you. All right. So let's move on to our challenge table. Our challenge was based on the demo last week, uh, last month from Clint Stevens. And basically the challenge was just to create some kind of human form. So if we can, uh, as you bring your item up, grab a ticket and drop a ticket. And we'll go through these pretty quickly, it looks like. And then we'll get right on to the show and tell. Okay. Who's going to be first? I like the piece that uh, our demonstrator had that was kind of a lady in a gown. And so that was what I was trying for. And uh, I'll admit I had to resort to my 80 grit gouge for the transitions at times. <laughs> All right, this was the first one I tried, and I just, it's a uh, spalted maple. I uh, had a big branch fall out of my tape, one of my maple trees, and I put it off to the side, and it spalted on me real good, so that's what this one, and then I like the one that he had that was, had the gown was painted, but, so I went one step farther, I cut up a blank that's six-sided and then overlaid it with walnut and then it gives you the different the the dress the shoes and the bust and made him made her a hat is that a segment of first I didn't wear everything right. Oh, is he still talking? Sorry. No. Um, I don't know if you're supposed to make a human form. I don't know if you're supposed to make all of it. So I just made the hand. Um, this is something I saw in uh, uh, Loveland, Colorado, a couple of years ago at a symposium. And I decided then I was going to make one. And it just seemed like now is the time. I haven't put a finish on it yet. Uh, starts out as a hollow form, and then that's my left hand. And remembering the previous one, the one I copied from, and this one, I can see that uh, you don't have to make it true to life, and it's probably not good to do so. Uh, it would have been better if it had been a little um, better shaped, I guess. Thank you. Where's the camera guy when you need him? Uh, so I, I've done some of such a it was, it was a long time ago, and uh, my, my daughter loves those little people toys. And so I wanted to make her like a little angel. Um, so it is actually turned on three axes, uh, but it's not quite as uh, as detailed as uh, um, the little clip that's been doing, um, the little clip was doing. And, uh, but Somebody told me how to do the wings, so now i got to figure out how to do the wings to, like, a platter and then cut the sections out of the platter. Um, but it's a little bit more robust because she's two, and she will break whatever you put in her hands. Um, so, so there you go. So I had attempted um, some human forms off of something that I'd seen on Pinterest one time. And I found that by just offsetting on one axis, you could enhance the bust and the butt at the same time and take off the front and the back shoulders. So it worked pretty good. Cutoffs worked wonderful for creating old, a hat. It was the quickest turn they ever get to. Um, then I used a little, I think, uh, artist putty to just make them so that they'd stay on um used a coat rod or, or a coat hanger and just cut off to, to make the rod down there 
but these were these got me out of a I think a Valentine's Day gift one year. So I I was it was a good job. Um, this one I tried I I tried my best to kind of follow the instructions and what I remembered from the demonstration, and I decided that this one turned out kind of in the uh, uh, world of inclusiveness. This is a female that relates to a male or a male that feels more like a female kind of knock me <laughs> off centered and that um i'd like to try it again because there were steps that i realized after the fact that oh i forgot to do this i forgot to trim down this diameter it was the same as the shoulders and i forgot to offset the head so that it looked like it met the neck correctly but uh ultimately i was close and I know that I can do it if I try it again. So I think they call that non-binary. <laughs> that's that's non-binary for sure. <laughs> Anybody else have a challenge piece? Okay. We are going for a ten dollar craft supply gift. We're going to get thank you for that supply. Rick, pull out a winner. Read off the last three. Three zero three. Three zero three. It's me. Huh. RL. Oh. Oh. Here you go, sir. I'm sure you can use that. Okay. Thank you for everybody that participated in the challenge last month. Remember that next month, where our challenge is to uh, turn something that you can incorporate a enamel or or another item into the the piece so um how you would marry the two together and we'll move right on then to our uh show and tell table so if you've got a show and tell item um come on up and tell us about it we'll start with tony I saw this type of uh, candlestick. I always thought it was kind of interesting to see. We had this elm tree in the front yard that was bigger around than this. And we went to uh, plant some new trees. We ran into roots that are about this big around. So I ended up having three roots about this long. So I thought, it's dry enough now. So I made a, a candles holder. Kind of like the design. So I tried it with a piece of elm and some walnut. One of the things I found was they're kind of tippy. So I ended up drilling the bottom out and filling it with lead shot and uh, epoxy. So kind of interesting. It's tough. So um, last month I was able to, I had the opportunity to go to the San Diego Woodturners Club and the demonstration was to make a Christmas tree. Uh, some of them were straight. This happens to be a, a wonky one. Uh, there's a lot of bandsaw saw work to it. Uh, basically the only turning is you take a square piece and then you turn it around and leave the ends of it square so you can support it when you, on the bandsaw, when you cut it in two. And then use the bandsaw to make the, uh, the branches on it. And uh, also, this is, does not have any turning. It is all bandsaw work. Uh, this is a piece of uh, hackberry. And uh, you slice off the, uh, the bark and then make the the branches and so I like that so I, I tried it and uh, just for the fun of it I made a um, this bowl my neighbor is doing some uh, remodeling they had a piece of engineered uh, beam and so 
Um, the, it's like three sheets of plywood all glued together. So um, I just added the, the walnut uh, rim and the walnut bottom. wood I got from Effie. Uh, it was uh, birch. Uh, it was quite hard and crunchy. A lot of uh, pieces would fly off if you weren't careful. Um, and it's a, it actually had a, uh, it was a little taller than that, but I didn't see that it was going to make a good form if I kept it. And so I just cut off the bottom. Um, like someone mentioned, it's always nice when there's a big hole in it so that the shavings come out. <laughs> The other things we're taking, a, we're going to Liberty Heart, uh, High School, and we're taking a bunch of Christmas ornaments this time. And so I, I mean, you guys have probably seen these before. They're globe and icicles, and uh, you hollow out the globe so that it, uh, um, it doesn't hang too hard, too heavy on the tree. So at Halloween every year, or over the last couple few years, we've had a uh, pumpkin carving contest. And there was just an article in the AAW a couple of months ago that talked about pumpkin carving. And so I kind of, I don't, I wouldn't say I read the article as much as I kind of looked through the pictures and kind of followed a little couple of the paragraphs and went at it and took off. And this is what I ended up with. And I think that, you know, there's nothing really unique to a, thick cut hollow form that's got stripes on it um i did though incorporate the uh method that was taught to us at one of our demonstrations where you use uh, i used a dremel tool on a sled while this was on the lathe so that i could kind of dremel straight lines as i was doing that so i used that technique most of the interest in it though is in in the top of it and actually the carving and i found um, the lines that make up the stem as they twist around the stem give it a lot of interest versus just a straight line or something. So I did get that out of the article. It, it was a, a, a well-written article. But this is my idea of pumpkin carving, but it wasn't the whole office's idea of pumpkin carving. So. this whole exercise first is find a really good burl. I mean, one that's solid. Okay. What that really just translates to is spend some money. So let's get, get the platform started here with the burl I bought was a hundred and 110 pounds roughly. And it was 25 inches by 20. And I thought I could probably get a 20 inch bowl. We got 18 and that required a little bit of innovation. So the first thing, uh, the bowl was $120 and shipping was a hundred or four. I don't know. It ended up roughly 250 bucks in it. So I was happy to find out it was a really good bowl, but the challenge of it is of course, is that you want to maximize the volume that you get from the bowl, which means you're going to have some challenges because you have the gnarly part, the exterior of the bowl that you'd like to preserve. So if you look closely, you'll see the bowl nibbles are here um, under the bottom. So let's get to the point. The first thing you do is turn the bowl to the size you want it and the shape you want it, right? You saw it on the inside and then you find that you have holes. And so you think about, I built a, a paper mache mold that covered the outside of this, but first wrap the, the wood with uh, bubble wrap. And then I put a clear um, kitchen wrap 
traditional uh, clear uh, mm -hmm. plastic wrap around the bubble wrap. And that's so that you're building a mold from paper mache bags, in other words, leaf bags. That's the best paper you can find. It's craft. It's very tough, and it'll stay together when it's wet. And you can do this in a short order. So you create a, a mold, and the object is kind of to do two things, to create a way to fill these voids that are in the in the wood, and then basically minimize the amount of resonance you got to use, because somehow they don't give resin away today. And so, essentially, with a bubble wrap in it, when the, the paper mache dries, it shrinks. And so I still had to cut six slits to the side to get the paper away from the wood. But that gave me the half inch I wanted around the bowl, I mean, the burl at this point, the rough bowl, to pour the resin in. And you want to be careful when you start thinking about using resins because if you have a fast setting resin, it's going to heat up like quick. So you want a penetrating resin, I mean, a, uh, yeah, like a slow setting resin, meaning you're going to take a day to cure. And so I use total boat penetrating resin on the first uh, bottom part of this because it had the most nooks and crannies in it. So that gets us. A, and then to hold the barrel into the mold, I had a 35 pound weight that I used to hold a bowl down. And then we poured a little short of a liter of resin around this. And that gave me a starting point. So now we have to think about it. I did find another interesting thing. This thing weighed 100 pounds, like I said, to start with. Well, I got a little back problem. And so I thought I got to find a way to put this wood on my lathe. And so I went to a scrapyard and looking for a personal lift that they use in hospitals or like in our nursing home, you can't get out of bed. Well, we'll jack you up and take you away. And it, a very mobile platform reminds me a lot of a motor hoist, right? But it is as neat as thing to move around. And it, it has wide legs, so you can just roll it up on the end of your leg, lathe. And that's how I got this thing into the lathe by myself. <laughs> so we now have this resin-filled burl. And uh, the next thing you want to do is to put it on your lathe and turn this and also get your coring tool out and core the thing. And so that's when you find out whether the resin penetrated in the way you wanted it to or not. So we now have a bowl and it's it basically shaped in about three quarter to five eighths inch wall thickness and I sanded that. And then the first thing I did then was to put uh, walnut oil on it. And that was a really bad mistake because resin and walnut oil do not like each other. So that's the deal where that just kind of, I sanded it all off. <laughs> just, I just thought maybe you might have had that experience, but <laughs> okay. So we got a bowl and we've sanded it down and we think we're ready to do something with it. And then I decided, well, okay, it's time to do the epoxy coating on it. So if, to overcome the walnut oil, we used um, spar varnish to varnish the whole thing. And then you sand that down. And the only thing wrong with spar varnish, it takes a long time to dry. And if it's not dried well, when you go to sand it, you'll find out and it'll be cloudy and it'll look just damn awful and you get to sand the whole thing off. I don't know that for experience. <clears throat> okay, so now we've got our bowl sealed and you start to do the epoxy. So the first thing you need is a turning mechanism. And this, you can go to the videos and, and John Williams is a guy who started at one of the early uh, resin coating Process. And he does some really nice work and his stuff is on Etsy. And if you like a sink that he's made, it's a standing sink. You want $4,000 for it. It's one of the neatest pieces I've seen turned, but it, you know, it's a burl. <laughs> so now we are faced with what do we do to get the lathe working out? This ties up your lathe. So you're not going to turn anything else while you're working on this. So I got on eBay and I found a really good 10 RPM motor that was uh, using some medical device for $13. So I've adapted that to my lathe. So you, you've got two chucks, one on the inside 
you know, inside turning, and, and this is now on the outside because it's 18 inches and my, 16 inches is my inside depth. Uh, so while we're now able to turn this, you start putting epoxy on. And so you mix about five ounces of resin to do each side, essentially. Now you're going dri to, it'll drip, run, and be a mess, but it's going around while you're smearing it on and so forth. So you get one coat done, you let it dry about four hours or five hours, and you can come back and put the second coating on top of the first coating, and you've not sanded any, right? You're just getting it on. And since it's turning, it doesn't run much. And uh, so when you let this go for another day, then you come back and now you get to sand and find out how uniform your coating was. And so after you've sanded, you start then at 300 and you go to 5,000. And then if, you, or rather you put on the last coat and after that's dried for a day, you come back and you sand and go through the series mm -hmm. and then you get to buff it when you're all done. And when you get through this year, you say, I'm not ready to do that again. <laughs> but since I cored it, I've got the core has now been cored. So I have bowl number two, and it is a, this is 18, that one is 16 inches. And then hopefully I can go by inch steps. And it bowl seems to be, I mean, the burrow seems to be pretty stable. So I didn't mean it takes long, but happy to entertain questions. But anyway, like I said, pick pick the bowl carefully, the burl carefully, because if it is not a good solid piece, I wouldn't recommend you doing this. Uh, I came from northern Iowa. I got in touch with a woodcutter up there who essentially has burls on eBay, and I bought a burl. I did a. This is not my first epoxy, but it's the first decent one. And uh, I, so I got in touch with him directly, and he said, I've got just the thing you need. So I said, oh, how much? And that's what I took it for, deep breath. But anyway, I'm happy to, to do that. And so I entertain you any questions. But you do have to be careful with the choice of resin, because if it eats up, like on the bottom, I didn't think about that, but it, it went, went into exothermic in a hurry. Oh, really? So we did some sanding and got rid of most of the bubble. But anyhow, so that's the story. Very nice. All right. All right. Thank you, David. Thanks for sharing. That's beautiful. Okay. I think that brings us to a close of another meeting. Um, appreciate some help getting the chairs put back. And uh, I think we probably ought to roll out the equipment from behind the curtain for the Woodworkers Guild, if anybody wants to be around to help with that. Thank you, everybody, for showing up tonight. I know it was, uh, they were talking on the weather like it could get bad, but I think we're going to miss that, and I want everybody to be safe going home. So see you next month, I hope. Uh, actually, I hope I see some of you at Santa's Workshop this weekend. Uh, please take a look at the Sign Up Genius if you're thinking about uh, volunteering some time. And beyond that, I will see you guys at the uh, December holiday party, I hope. Thank you very much for attending tonight. Good night.